Hello, and welcome to the Art of Selling Online Courses. We're here to share winning strategies and secret hacks from top performers in the online course industry. My name is John Ainsworth, and today's guest is Hanna Vervik. She's the CEO at Thrive Themes, and her goal is to level up, do shit, fail, get better, improve, and she strives to do, get everyone around her to do the same. Now, today we're going to cover a couple of different things because Hanna runs Thrive Themes, and they are completely badass at all kinds of elements of the funnel and not just around the actual technology of it, but about also the, the tactics of how do you get better at it? How do you make it better? And so we're going to talk through some stuff around landing pages, landing page optimization and optimizing parts of the funnel. But we're also going to talk about something else that Hana does, which is around creating a calm company. And so we're going to talk about specific tips and examples of implementing the calm company philosophy at Thrive Themes. Before we get into that, I've got an important question for you. If you own a course or authority website, did you know there's a shortlist of techniques that can help you to double to quadruple your revenue? There's about eight techniques that my team uses to help online course creators grow their revenue. And the average rate of return from using these techniques is 428%. So go to courseprofitreport.com and fill in the survey there. And we're going to create a personalized profit increase report for you. So it's courseprofitreport.com. And we will we'll create that report for you, tell you what you need to do to grow your revenue. So, Hannah, welcome to the show. Hey, John. Happy to be here. Excited. Sounds like fun topics. Nice. So, I want to start right at the beginning with landing pages for lead magnets. How should someone be able to tell whether it's worth working on that landing page? Like, what's a good conversion rate? How should they figure out if that's a, a step that's worthwhile improving? All right, for lead generation landing pages, so anything where you give away something for free, if you're not getting a 30% opt-in rate, I would say that it's worth starting to improve on that. That's kind of our benchmark that we use for the company. It might slightly differ depending on the type of traffic that you're sending to the landing page, but you should be able to get like a 30, 40% on a good landing page. So anything underneath that, I would definitely, definitely worth optimizing. One of the things we've been interested about recently is there seems to be a difference in conversion rate depending on where the traffic's come from, whether it's from social media or whether it's from like SEO traffic on page or whether it's from ads, this kind of thing. When you say 30%, what kind of traffic source are you thinking of that would lead to that? So that is really overall traffic. So that is basically if you have a landing page where some people who read your blog posts, they land on that landing page, you have some adverts or Facebook ads traffic that leads on that landing page, the overall traffic should be 30%. If you're sending this to your list, or if you're sending this to people who are already familiar with your stuff, I would expect to see a higher conversion rate than, than 30%. So that is why, yeah, that's kind of the benchmark of like all traffic combined. Okay. Yeah, we've seen some clients where they've got a YouTube channel and then they link from the YouTube videos or from the show notes back to their landing page. They're getting like a 70% opt-in rate, yeah. which is obviously yeah. like skews the numbers a little bit, makes it look <laughs> a lot better, you know? <laughs> totally does, totally does. And I think we might talk about that also in like optimizing your landing page, but depending whether it's cold traffic or uh, what we call like hot traffic where people already know you, where they know what you stand for, obviously you will get different conversion rates. So it's why I do find it a difficult question when somebody asks like, oh, what's a good conversion rate? If you tell me that you send something to your own list and you're getting a 30% conversion rate, I would say like, it's not resonating, you know, mm. like there, there is something wrong. Or But if it's from cold Facebook traffic that people haven't heard from you before, they click on an ad, they opt in, then 30% is actually a really good conversion rate. So it's really highly depends, but I think like that's just, we need to give a ballpark and, and that would be my ballpark range to, to start thinking about it. Yeah. And I, I've found the same kind of thing, like 30 to 40% is, is generally strong. If it's coming from social media, then yeah, it should be way higher. If it's from ads, then it's probably going to be lower than that. But as a ballpark, that's good. Okay. So let's say we decided, yet yeah, we're going to work on the landing page. We want to increase our opt-ins. What's some of the biggest things that you see people do wrong or what's some of the things that make the biggest improvements? Let's start with the things that people do wrong. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, a lot of people have enormous bias where they don't realize anymore that what they are offering is not clear because it is very clear to them because they know what they're offering and they think that, some, that it is written on the page. And when you actually read the page without having the background knowledge, you don't know what's in there. So people often try to be too 
descriptive with what they offer and it's not actually clear what the real benefit is or even what people will actually get it's like i've seen websites where it was like this is a transformative tool that will help you magnify your radiance (laughs) oh my god i have absolutely no idea what i will get when i get in i do not know what to expect i do not so yeah i think that curse of knowledge that's the word i was looking for the curse of knowledge is something that i see go wrong so so often the second thing in the wrong category would be to scamming (laughs) Mm. um where it's just like they People have seen maybe some landing pages where there's like red flashing buttons and and like arrows and then you need to have bold and you need to have amazing and superb and fake testimonials and all that kind of stuff. If it converts, it will be the wrong people that sign up to your list anyways. It will hurt your brand. Um, It's absolutely not something to do. And then the third big mistake that I've seen people make is focus on things that don't matter. So they will change one word and it will be a synonym of what it already was or they spend hours and hours perfecting the ebook cover of their offer but their title is not good their headline sucks so yeah basically focusing too much or the color of the bottom i think that is my favorite example because so many people have heard about like amazon and and how they tested that color of the button and even google tested the color of like what blue it should be and The amount of traffic that you need in order to get significant results from a slightly lighter blue or slightly darker blue is really never going to happen on your own website. So don't waste your time with that. I've got a friend when he joined, there's a network DC that you used to be in. I'm still in. He joined that and he came across so many different weird niches, so many different businesses that people had. And he decided to have a laugh with it one time. So he told everybody that he was a button color consultant. And (laughs) he said he would work with these brands and he would help them identify what color the button should be. And he'd do these long research studies and then, you know, uh, A-B tests and all this kind of thing to try and figure out. And people said to him, what what color does it normally work? You know, what's what's common results you get from it? He's like, oh, it's blue. It's always blue. (laughs) But you can't just tell people that. You've got to do the whole study first. And then at the end of it, you find that it's blue. And everyone's like, the DC's got so many weird niches in there that everyone's like... (laughs) This could be true. This might be his job. <laughs> this could actually be something. Um, yeah. But but yeah, color buttons, let's not even waste our time with that. Let's go with three things also that I believe people should spend time on and uh, that are really, that can make a difference on your landing page and that I've seen make a difference. It's, first of all, I want people to go for big changes. Mm-hmm. So like I said, don't just change one word that is kind of a synonym. If you change something, change something big. So go from an, a landing page that doesn't have a video to a landing page that has a video, for example. That's a big change. That is worth testing. The other one is definitely the second one would be the headline. So your headline, you're above the fold section. It's what people will see first. That headline needs to grab your attention. Now, a couple of ways or things that you can do with that headline is change it to a question and make sure that people say yes to the question. So if it's something like, Are you looking to lose weight without spending an hour in the gym? Okay. People say yes, they will be interested in what comes next. So having that question would be really good. One of the things that we've seen working very, very well is using a testimonial as the headline. Mm -hmm. So in the, the first line being like, I thought it would be impossible to lose weight without spending an hour in the gym, but I used this and it worked. So that's, again, it's something where people are like, oh, now I need to read on. Or the the headline, that's a curiosity headline. It's also a very typical one that works very well. So it would be something like the weird three uh, things that you can do to lose weight without spending an hour in the gym. So the headline is really the first one. The second one would then be your bullet points. So you have to apply that same logic to your bullet points. And you need to make sure that people, when they read the bullet points, their reaction is like, oh, I want to know this. Or, oh, I need this, you know. And I find that one of the best ways to do this is actually to go over your your lead magnet and to write down everything that is a feature in your lead magnet. So people, because what I often see in in bullet points is it's not very exciting. People are like, oh, it's a 30 page ebook or it's a three video course 
or it has 20 chapters, whatever. Like those are features. Those are things that aren't very interesting for people, but you have to translate those into benefits for, for the people who get your lead magnet. Now this works the same for sales pages as it works for lead generation pages. So mm. it's, it's actually really interesting, but my favorite way of, of doing this and catching myself when I'm talking about features instead of benefits is listing all the features for whatever I'm trying to sell. And let's be honest, like even a lead magnet, you're actually trying to sell. The price is just the email address instead of money, Um, but you still have to sell it, you still have to promote it. So you start with those features and then you ask yourself, so you take the feature and then you put behind that feature, which allows you to, or this allows you to. So if one of the features is that it's a 25 page ebook, which allows you to, read this in less than 15 minutes, which allows you to go back to it uh, several times to underline, to highlight whatever you need to do, which allows you to print it out and to hang it on your wall, which allows you to, and then it becomes even more interesting if you take those things after the, which allows you to, and do that again, which allows you to. So our 25 page ebook, which allows you to print it and hang it on your wall, which allows you to keep it in front of you and never lose these techniques out of mind. Now, this is probably a way more interesting thing to put on your sales page, on your lead generation landing page than the actual feature. So if you say like, okay, so our, our ebook that we're selling, that we're selling, that we're, we're promoting is like, okay, so now this three-part video, which allows you to watch anywhere, whenever you are for example. So that is then really the benefit. And so in those bullet points, you have to use the benefits and then you have to create some curiosity. So if you have a special technique that you are using in your ebook, if you have some, again, use that, yeah, that that curiosity hook of like the special way that the, give your thing a name that's even more interesting. So the profit machine method that I use for, uh, for, that I use to get 420% extra you know, for my leads, like that type of stuff. And then the third one that you can- Sounds do. like a good one. I should come up with, I should- uh... <laughs> Yeah, yeah sounds like somebody who knew what they were doing wrote that. <laughs> and then the third one would really be that trust factor. So is there anything that you can do to increase the trust for on that landing page? And typically it's testimonials. That's the easiest way to increase the trust factor. It's to have, even on your lead magnet, it's to make sure that you have testimonials of people who use it, who went through it, who liked it, and who had value from it, and then use that on your lead generation landing pages. All right. So we got make big changes, for example, video versus not video, rather than changing the button color or changing one word, because it's just ridiculous. You'll never learn. Even if your button is a better color, it would take you enormous amounts of data which you don't have to find out if it's true and the difference it will make is tiny whereas changing the headline or the video or something like that it's gonna be a big change Mm -hmm. change the headline and make that really fucking good what i see most people do with headlines is describe the thing and that's it like on sales pages it's really upset it really upsets me and i know that that's like i shouldn't get upset by this but it really really upsets me i'm just like this headline is terrible. It's like, just tells you the name of the course. And it's like, this is one of the biggest, like the offer is the biggest thing, right? But the second biggest thing is the headline. You change the headline, it increases your conversion rate. It makes people stick around on the page longer. It gets them excited. Write a good headline and people just have the name of the course or the name of the lead magnet or what have you. It's like, you've got an opportunity to give people something exciting here. So we had a few ideas. There was curiosity-based ones. There was get this without that. So whatever the biggest desire they have is without their biggest downside, you know, uh, get you know, lose weight without spending an hour in the gym. And then what was number three? Testimonials. So use a testimonials quote from one of your customers as the headline. And then number three is adding those testimonials to the page. So Yeah. So testimonials, testimonials in the headline, video. testimonials <laughs> on the rest of the page. Brilliant. All right, cool. So... All right, so we've covered some really deep and dirty like tactics for improving your option rate on your landing page. Can I add one more? Okay, because go I for know it, that please. People are going to be mad at me because <laughs> when when with the color of the button, then always people are like, "Oh, but I tested it and it changed my conversion rates." There's one exception to the rule: if your button does not stand out and you change it to a color that stands out, it will change your conversion rate. 
So if your whole page is blue colored and you add an orange button on there, it will do better than your blue button. Now, the reason for that is purely that, that it will attract the eye and that people will pay attention. If you scan over your page and you use blurred eyes and you can't see your buttons, there's a problem. You're not doing a good job at making it extremely clear what you want people to do and where they need to click. So that's the one exception on our color button. <laughs> okay, okay. So maybe change the color of your button. <laughs> Only if it makes it stand out significantly more. <laughs> Got it. All right, cool. So now I want to change gears and I want to talk to you about something really fascinating that you're working on, which is building a calm company. And so what does that mean? What is this philosophy? Where has this come from? So a calm company means that, for me, it mainly means that you care as much about the people in the company and their well-being as you care about your customers. Mm. And the reason that I'm so, I mean, you can say obsessed <laughs> with this is because of what is happening in software and because of the big VCs buying up software companies and then expecting a 10x return and um, people going into depression and um, yeah, not having holidays and having like these crazy targets and just needing to burn through and grow as fast and as big as possible to get that 10x return that investors are expecting. Um, at Thrive Themes, we're a bootstrapped company. So the, the huge advantage of that is that we don't have to talk to anyone in the sense of like nobody is asking us to get a certain return, which means that we can make the choices that are good for the people in the company and that are good for our customers and that we don't have to chase to that crazy growth constantly. And when I say a calm company, it really makes for, yeah, these objectives that, that are reasonable where people can, like, I don't expect anyone to work after 6 p.m. People are not working in the weekends. There's, there's no uh, keep your phone on 24 hours a day type of, of situation. Part of this is, is the European mentality. <laughs> I know that there is a huge difference between the work mentality in the U.S. versus uh, in, in Europe. I've worked in France for a long time. The 35-hour work week is the normal, is the standard there. And it's still a very productive country. So I don't believe that more hours necessarily means that you get more work done. I don't believe that not taking holidays is a good thing. So yeah, that's, that's where this idea of a calm company comes from. It's like, how can we make sure that everyone feels good while doing the work and, and while having an, a, a good company? When I was getting this business started I worked too much and didn't take enough holidays and didn't take enough breaks and worked too many weekends and obsessed about work too much and I reached a point last year about October when I realized I wasn't just tired it was just like oh no this is like a serious long-term exhaustion so I was at a conference and I had someone come up to me and say oh hey John how you doing and I'm like I get that quite a lot because I talk at a lot of these conferences. So people have seen me and they know who I am and I, I don't remember everybody. And I was like, okay, that's not that big of a deal. I don't remember them. Okay. And I, so I said, oh, hi, you know, nice to meet you or whatever. And he said, oh no, we, we talked on zoom for an hour, two weeks ago and you helped me out with my business loads. It was great. I was just like, but he was clearly confused by how I didn't recognize him. Now that's quite bad that I hadn't remembered him. But it wasn't like after that, I went, oh, God, of course, yes. N no, no I, had, I had nothing. I had nothing there at all. And he told me about his business. I'm like, I don't remember anything about this. I was like, I, have, I cannot believe this actually happened. And then that happened again in the same conference. Mm. It was another person. I was just like, if I don't notice this as a warning sign, then I'm going to look back and be like, what an idiot. Why did you not recognize this? Like, I should have seen this yeah. earlier, how bad it was. So I started taking a lot more time off after that. But it was like it freaked me out. It's just like, it's no good. It really isn't. And, and one of the problems with burnout is that it slowly creeps up on you. And once you're in burnout, you can't recognize burnout anymore. Mm. And, and so it is like this very, this vicious circle. And it's one of the reasons why I, I truly believe that other people need to protect you um, and that there need to be those guardrails in place because 
unfortunately, like we also learned this this the hard way, right? From from people do having burnout and and where you're like, oh, I I never realized this. Mm. I didn't like they always seemed enthusiastic and they were super happy doing their work and they were. And they didn't realize that little by little that creeps up. And then you're like, oh, it's true. Like they haven't taken holidays in, in, in a long time. They haven't taken time off. And so, yeah, now like <laughs> forcing people to take time off and actually being like, it will be okay. Like <laughs> we're yeah. not going to fall apart if, if you're not here for a week or two. And also making sure that you're not going to fall apart if one one person in the business isn't there for a week or two is just something else I need to do in order to to make sure that the company yeah doesn't have like those bottlenecks and, and those things that are depending on just one person. Yeah, one of the things we've instituted in our company is that if you don't take your holiday, then you get forced to. Yeah. it's like it's tracked how many days holiday have you taken and it's like oh, you haven't taken enough you have to take time off mm. and it's kind of weirds people out because they've never seen that before <laughs> you know? but it's like it's important it, this isn't just for you this is for you you'll have a nice time you'll do something fun whatever but it's like for us too we can't have you just working all the time it's it's a terrible idea yeah yeah exactly and and i think the other way to implement this is also with like the goals that you set because yeah, there's, there's like this idea of like this big, hairy, audacious goals. Now, the truth is, if you set goals and you're constantly not hitting those goals, it's just very frustrating for everyone involved. And and it just makes that you're like in a, um, I call it a dream and wishing culture, where, you know, like, I, of course, I can be like, hey, guys, we're going to double our revenue over the next quarter. But if you don't put the proper things in place to actually make that happen it's not gonna happen and then you can just be very frustrated with people not doing double the work <laughs> because <that's> what <laughs> double the revenue or whatever <laughs> but yeah at some point it's, if people are working efficiently and of course there's always you know there's always improvements to make there um, but if like if people aren't slacking, then everybody is kind of working and at, at the capacity that they can. And then I think like setting these crazy big goals without actually putting the resources behind it to make it happen is basically just setting your team up for failure. Yeah, it's so much more fun to end the quarter with like, oh my God, like this is everything that we did. Like we hit 90% of our goals rather than being like, oh, this one huge thing that we were supposed to hit and we only did half of it. Like, mm. yeah. So how do you approach that? How do you go about setting goals specifically in order to do that? Is it just about having more realistic goals or is there a, a whole process for that? We do have a, a, a fairly in-depth process, I would say, for setting goals. You might have heard of Traction. So EOS is the, yeah. And we've been using Traction, I would say, for three years now. Uh, that we implemented it and, and started using it. And so for those who are not familiar with this system, it's um, like, from on, on the biggest level, you said like a, a five-year vision and 10-year vision and then three years, one year. And so what we did in the beginning of the year is that I really asked all the managers in the company, like, hey, what, like, what are some things that you would like to accomplish? Like, what are some things that you would like to do? Where would you like to see the company go in? And those, like, there was no limitation on that. Like, everyone could say whatever they wanted. Like, even if they were like, hey, we need to get away from WordPress and we need to, uh, to start a SaaS company. Like, that that was on, like, on the table, right? Mm -hmm. Where And then from there, I looked at it and there were, like, very clear indications or very clear themes that people, like, that everyone wanted to work on, that everyone wanted to get better at. And so from there, we set goals of the year which are not quantifiable goals. So it's not like, oh, this is like, we need to make this much revenue or we need to sell this many products. It was like, those goals are really like, okay, this is the vision for the year. This is where we want to go this year. And then uh, we break it down in the quarterly rocks, which then we have company rocks and then everyone from their team sets the, the rocks for their team. And those quarterly rocks are based on like, okay, where are we on our vision for the year? What's the first step that we need to take on that vision? How can we break that down? And then in the realistic part now, I think for, for us, like as a software company, we just, we kind of know like how much development time do we have? What's, what's realistic this quarter? And especially because the way that our development team works is that 
they the product team is already working on stuff like months before our developers actually start working on it and we have uh, four week cycles so in a quarter there are only three cycles <laughs> mm. and and it's not that hard to realize but like of course we always are like oh maybe we can put this one into or whatever but if product didn't prepare it in quarter minus one then it's not going to happen in this quarter so on the development we really have that advantage of like kind of knowing what we can commit to and it took us a long time to get there like we used to be really really bad at our commitments and and we got much much better at, at knowing like what is possible with the huge advantage that now like we've the first six months of the year I think like with maybe a month delay, but we hit all of our commitments that we made, which which is really, really awesome. And yeah, so so that's kind of how, how we approach it now, where it's just like, we're, we're not just putting this huge project on the timeline if we haven't started working on it yet, if we haven't, you know, and we break it down and like, okay, well, maybe this month we actually can do the research for that project which means that next month we can actually start preparing for it, which means, so yeah, breaking it down in like those smaller chunks to actually have a realistic view of what's possible. Got it. So there's the five or 10 year vision. There's the three year plan, the one year plan, the quarterly, and then within the quarters, you've got three one month cycles. Yeah. For, for some teams. So like the, for me, like for example, for the marketing team, I find a quarter too long because there's, there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen quicker than than one quarter so that team for example very specifically is more on a monthly cycle and same with the development team because our development cycle is on uh, is one month but then for example for support the initiatives that we have are more like over the quarter or improvements that we will see over the quarter we got a similar kind of time frame as what you're talking about in our system and we just did ours today actually we do every six weeks so it's two per quarter basically and we don't exactly match them up with quarters. We focus just on these cycles. But it's we found that when we had stuff for a quarter, by the end of the quarter, everyone would be like, oh, well, I finished that bit, but then this thing doesn't make sense and the world's kind of changed and we've learned more stuff and we cut it back until we got to six weeks. And it's fascinating because in six weeks, what we found is everybody can do one initiative in six weeks if it's cut down small enough. Mm. And so everybody in the team gets an initiative that is one thing to get done to improve the business. So they're doing the current job of running the business and then one thing to make it better. And every single time that we go through it, the instinct is like what you said of the, oh, but we could just fit this one more thing in. And we have written in our SOP for it at the top, like you must cut this down until it's something that's absolutely 100% achievable. Because what if they're off for a week and then they're ill for a few days and then something's delayed because they're waiting on something from somebody else? And they will. They will. So that's the thing. Yeah. Like there's always stuff coming up. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, there's always wires to put out. There's always like, well, you like you say, you still do your normal day-to-day -day work. Yeah. So it always takes a little bit longer than what you estimated. So yeah, like I really like this, this framework of if you could only do like one thing, if this is the only thing that happened, would you be, would you be happy and would it be good for the business? And that's also how I try to approach like the, the quarterly company goals where I'm like, okay, if this quarter, and because it's over quarter, we usually set three because it's also for all the teams and so on. Um, but like three to like five is the absolute maximum. It's like, okay, if this quarter, all we did was this, like nothing else happened other than just like the day-to-day, -day, like, but no other initiatives, no other new stuff. Would you be happy? And and when you can dial it down to those, then you know that you're working on the most important stuff, which which is good. And what's fascinating with this is, at the one hand, you start out the cycle and you think, "But I want to do all these other things." But then, if you look at it and you do, you know, for us, one of these every six weeks, then every year you get so eight of these, and in eight times a year, everybody in the team, there's eight of us in the team, everybody makes an improvement then that's 64 improvements overall to the whole business. It's massive. That's huge. Adds up so much. And because you're actually setting realistic targets, it means they actually get done. Instead of you set unrealistic ones, then half of it doesn't ever get finished. And it could have been the best thing didn't get done because the worst thing was the easiest one, you know, and yeah, it's like yeah. so good. <laughs> All right. So 
what kind of impact has this had on the business? So have you always had this in place? And if not, what's it been like before and after? The before and after is chaos versus calm. Like I, <laughs> I really can't describe it differently. I think about like, let's say four years ago, what are we now? 2022, 2018. Yeah. That would probably have been like internally our peak chaos <laughs> in the company. Everybody was working on stuff. Nobody really knew what the priorities are. We couldn't hit any deadlines anymore. Um, stuff got released without it being actually finished. It was a mess. <laughs> like It was a hot mess. And, and I think like it didn't make anyone happy because it's, it's one of those things that if you don't know what success looks like, it's really, really hard to be, to be happy in your job. Because if you're not knowing if you're actually doing a good job, then you're just doing stuff. And when we started to put in place like these these rhythms where it's like, okay, we we have like the traction meeting every week and we have this company rocks and and the, the yearly goals and so on. It just put it order where we also at the same time like did some reorganizing in our org chart where it was like, okay, who's actually reporting to who? Like who's managing who? Because even that was not very clear because we went from being like this tiny startup to just like massive growth, hiring people because you need more people. And then all of a sudden you have this, this big company and like we're 65 people now. So yeah, that doesn't work organically. <laughs> like you actually need some organization mm. in place. Yeah, that is, I would say, like I was saying now, the thing is now I'm in a position where I'm extremely confident that anything that we set our mind to doing we can do. And that is such an amazing feeling because four years ago, we had so many ideas of things that we wanted to do and nothing happened. Like we, we weren't capable of actually bringing any of those ideas to market. Mm. Um, and it, 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 was, <laughs> it was a pretty, a pretty complicated time. Whereas now we're like, okay, these are the products we're working on. These are the features we're working on. These are the marketing campaigns we're working on and so on. And, and yeah, it's just way more streamlined and it just makes that what you set out to do, you can actually do it, which is, which is really nice. Nice. Sweet. So everybody go out and buy traction which yeah. I tell everybody to buy all the time. Make sure it's the one by Gino Wickman, which is also good, but it's not, that's not what we're talking yeah, about. No, it's not that and it's, oh my God, there's a, there's a test you can do at the back of the book, I think. And the first time I took that test, I got like 23 out of a hundred. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this might be useful. Now, now the truth is, and I think I actually, one of the reasons why I love this one so much is because it basically starts with saying like, if you don't have any management system in place right now, just pick one. Like mm. anyone will be better than, than no managing system. So like certain people will be like the, the Google has one where it's like, it's not KPIs, but uh, OKRs. Mm -hmm. Like Google has one like based on OKRs. And then, the, so there are different like management systems and, and uh, different way of doing this. Now, the reason that I loved EOS and, and tractions is, is just because it, it fit what, what we wanted to do. And mm. because it is so clearly explained step by step. Like I feel in the book, like the book is a textbook. Like it, it really mm. is just like, okay, now go out and implement this. And if you implement it, you will see results. Now, obviously, if you implement it for three months, you're not going to see results. Like you have to do it like consistently. Like it took us more than a year to like get better at actually setting those rocks and not over committing and, and all of that kind of stuff because it's still fun to do that <laughs> <laughs> at the time yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean i still i still catch myself where i'm like yeah, but maybe we, you know like because i'm one of those people where nothing goes fast enough so I, mm. i'm always like oh come on we, we can do some more and i'm like no actually like let's just like if only this happens we would be happy yeah we've basically gone through every three months and reviewed it and done it again and like found done the test again and found what what level are we at now with any of these things let's choose one or maybe two steps in there to improve at nice. improve them over the next few months do it again and we got up to i think we're about like 80 something 83 or something at the moment the score so there's still got miles to go but it's so much better the company runs so much more smoothly with that whole system it's amazing yeah we need to take the test again actually that's a good idea like a reminder going oh yeah i forgot about that bit Yes, every single person in the team is supposed to have one number that they're responsible for. Okay, 
okay, let's figure that one out next. <laughs> yeah, I still find that a hard one. <laughs> yeah. And I we also haven't... like, I do think that it is important to adapt it to your own company. And, and mm. it's more about like pick and stick, like pick something and then stick with it. Yeah, 100%. Hannah, this is amazing. Thank you so much. If people want to go and learn more about Thrive Themes, which is for anybody who doesn't know that, can you give everyone like the elevator pitch on what Thrive Themes is, what, how it works, what it does for them? Sure. So Thrive Themes, we're a suite of WordPress tools that allow you to create your online business. So in the suite, you will find things like a page builder, a lead generation tool, quiz builder, and um, Thrive Apprentice, which could be really interesting for your audience, which is a, an online course building platform. So if you have a WordPress website and you want to build your online course, then you can do that with Thrive Apprentice. So yeah, and Thrive Suite is really just like a whole bundle of conversion-focused, marketing-optimized plugins that work together seamlessly to help you create that online business and spend more time on your business and actually um, like getting your audience and getting more sales and, and less time on figuring out the tech. Perfect. And what's the site? Where should people go? So thrivethemes.com and you will be able to find everything there. Beautiful. Amazing. Thanks again so much, Hannah. And thanks everybody for listening. Thank you, John.